everybody. Melissa Treebosser here for Frogs today as we begin our Fiesta Bowl college football playoff preview series for From the Other Sideline. My first guest to talk about this game, and I had to get him on because he's the first person I've seen to pick TCU to beat Michigan in the Fiesta Bowl. So I had to strike while the iron was hot. Joined today by uh, CBS National College Football writer Shahan Jayaraja. One of the best people I know from the University of Baylor and one of the, uh, you know, the, the ones that, that help us, you know, overcome our differences and our, and our odds to come together. He's actually wearing kind of purple. I'm wearing green. Sean, what, what are we doing here, man? Like, come on. Yeah, I, I don't know. Obviously, like everybody expected, we came into the season and uh, and me and Robert Griffin III are out here propping up TCU yeah. uh, on the national scene like everybody thought it. Yeah, just, just as we all anticipated, um, you know, I, I wanted to, to bring you on. You've covered a lot of TCU games. You were there at the Big 12 Championship. Uh, this is a program that you probably know far better than you care to at this point. Um, but also probably excited to know a little bit better because the access to TCU football this season under Sunny Dykes has been dramatically different. And I know you're someone that's certainly benefited from that. No question. And, you know, I, I will say, right, so I've covered TC, like you mentioned, for several years at this point. I did Big 12 coverage dating back to 2016. Uh, unfortunately, my group chat is filled with lots of TCU horn frogs, so I hear a lot about yes, them too. Uh, but no, I mean, look, I, I think dating back to his time at SMU, Sonny Dykes has been a coach who stood apart to me. Uh, I I did the magazine preview for them back in, in 2018 and 2019 and uh, for Dave Campbell's Texas football and it's just one of those situations where you go there, you talk to people in the building, you talk to him, and you just kind of realize this is this is kind of a different kind of guy. This is not what I expected. I've covered a lot of kind of basic air raid coaches uh, over the past little while uh, covering the state of Texas, and and he was not what I expected. I expected he was going to just kind of be this offensive mind, but it was pretty clear early on when I talked to him at SMU that he viewed himself as a program manager as a ceo he was not the guy who recruited jared goff and had him throw for a bunch of yards with no defense and and i think that you saw that happen in 2019 it was one of those things where you have a feeling and then it comes true obviously they win 10 games um and i was optimistic about what sunny dykes could be at tcu but holy crap did i not see this coming <laughs> right off the bat i i thought that you know i, I thought he would do a great job of setting a floor on the program where they win eight to nine games every single year and maybe have an up year. I didn't think that their up year would be year one. And I didn't think their up year would be the first big 12 team to finish the regular season undefeated uh, in the round robin era. So really impressed by what he's done so far. Uh, again, I, I, I know he wasn't probably the most exciting hire when he was made. And I think he recognizes that. Uh, I think he recognizes the way that he's seen and how people view his failure at Cal and all this sort of stuff. But I, I think it just makes him a better coach. And, and, uh, and look, I think that he does such a great job hiring assistants. Uh, I mean, Garrett Riley and Joe Gillespie, obviously are both, I think, head coaching candidates in the very near future. Um, and, and he's just going to keep that train rolling. So I, I've been so impressed by them i i can't believe this is the same tcu roster that i watched in 2021 it just doesn't even feel at all the same but uh but i think he's done a great job and and tcu is a very well deserved uh first playoff team from the state of texas you know you hit on so many points that that i would love to follow up on um, the humility of sunny dykes uh the the understanding the sense of self that he has uh but the first thing I got to get to is, is you talk about this is the same TCU roster. Like I said, you have been following this program for years, you know, whether it was at Dave Campbell's at CBS, uh, your time going back to diehards and, and even your time as a Baylor student. And so you have certainly seen kind of the evolution of, of TCU over the better part of the last decade. Um, when you look at, at a team that returns 82% of its roster uh, that goes from being unranked in the preseason pick to finish seventh and is able to do this under a first year head coaching staff. How rare is that in college football as a whole? I mean, there has never been a first year coach with a program to make the college football playoff. I mean, we can start there, right? The only two first year coaches who have made it are Lincoln Riley and Ryan Day, who were both promoted uh, from being offensive coordinator to full-time head coach. So this is very unusual. I, I think you mentioned as well, uh, 
offensively, the only real addition that they made who's contributed in any way was Alana Lee, who's playing center for TCU, who's a great player who played uh, who played for Sonny Dykes at uh, SMU and I think has been a huge part of uh, kind of being a steadying force on that offensive line, especially on the interior, where I think that TCU is, is strongest on the offensive line. And defensively, they had a couple of guys, obviously, uh, you know, Johnny Hodges at linebacker, they had Mark Perry at safety, and both those guys have played well. But, you know, Trey Tomlinson and, and Josh Newton were guys who were here before. And uh, uh, Demonic Williams is somebody who was uh, is a freshman, right? Like, th- these are guys who were on the roster. Dee Winters was somebody who was on the roster. This isn't uh, this isn't the Lincoln Riley adding the number one transfer class in the country, right? They added some key guys, but the contributors are mostly the same. And, and what's been different is the way that they're deployed, the way that they're coached. Uh, I, I think also just... You know, the confidence that they play with is completely different than what they've been in the past couple of years. I I think, um, you know, I I got to ask Sonny Dykes this past week a little bit about uh, kind of this roster, right? Because they are a team that's come back. And and obviously that's part of why uh, Max Duggan's in New York. But like, I I think that you look at uh, TCU as a team that never loses confidence over the course of games. And I think people can, can kind of read Sonny Dykes' personality as being ambivalent or uncaring or just kind of aloof but I think I think it's a quiet confidence right and you see that sort of come through this roster and all these players are playing with so much more confidence that they aren't playing uh you know looking over their shoulder worried they're gonna get pulled worried that they're gonna get yelled at I I think it's just a completely different dynamic and and look the talent has never been the primary issue in Fort Worth right I mean for all the talk about you know, the, the previous staff coaching these guys up and all that, which is true. Uh, you know, the, TCU has been the the number one recruiting team outside of Texas and Oklahoma for basically the entire Big 12 era. Like, they should be this team all the time. And now I think we finally get to see it happen. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right that the talent has been there, uh, but it's unlocking that talent and being able to take a, a team that returns 82% of its in production on both sides of the ball and, and make them into something completely unexpected, um, which I think a lot of that, you know, you talk about Sonny Dykes as a CEO type coach, a lot of that comes from the assistants. And so you have Garrett Riley, who's a finalist for the Broyles Award, and you have Joe Gillespie, who came in from Tulsa. Um, you know, you mentioned both of those guys are going to be head coaching candidates in the near future. What do you think that near future looks like? Does a playoff run kind of slow down that cycle and maybe buy the Horde Frogs one more year of keeping their staff together? Or, you know, are you hearing anything? Um, you know, there's a couple of jobs that would probably be appealing to both of those guys that that they might be candidates this year, despite the fact they they could be locked up here for the next month or so. Well, I will point to timing, right? Timing is very important in these searches. Like if, uh, if uh, Cincinnati doesn't miss out on the AAC title game, Maybe Luke Fickle is still the coach there, right? I think that mm-hmm. when you look at Lincoln Riley last year, the fact that he was able to leave before the Big 12 championship game is such a huge part of the timing of how that happened. And so, like you said, I think that I, I think that the timing really does work out for TCU here in a lot of ways, not just from the perspective of uh, of them interviewing for jobs right now, but also you know them wanting to stick around and, and do all that before, right? Because with the with the timeline right now with the early signing period everybody wants to get coaches in so early and one job that I will point to specifically for Joe Gillespie is, I, you know, I think that he was a name bandied about at Tulsa uh, because obviously he spent multiple years there under Phil Montgomery and had a lot of success on the defensive side of the ball. Well, they wanted to move quick. And so they ultimately end up hiring Kevin Wilson, the offensive coordinator from Ohio State, a team that, by the way, missed the conference championship game. So he was able to go interview that week. Right. So I think all this stuff matters. I think all this stuff helps. Um, you know, look, Garrett Riley is going to be sought after both as a head coaching and offensive coordinator candidate. He just is, right? I, I think that a lot of people at Texas A&M have talked themselves into the idea that they can money with Garrett Riley. Riley and and look, I mean, I think TC is going to do everything in its power to keep him, but Texas A&M might throw $2 million at him, and, and that's a decision he'll have to make. Now, I think that they're probably both back next year. And the other thing that I'll mention, too, is that uh, – you know, look, Rhett Lashley was hired away when he was at, when uh, Sonny Dykes was at SMU and he replaced him with Garrett Riley, who's in some ways made the program even better than than when Rhett, Rhett yeah. Lashley was there. So it's not like he can't identify the next guy if that time comes True. as well. But uh, I, I think certainly everybody in Fort Worth would love uh, at least one more year, if not more, with uh, with this pair of coordinators, because it's been a match made in heaven. 
well, yeah, you, you know, you, you make this magical run on year one with so many guys coming back, but you're going to look at, at quite a bit potentially of roster turnover going into 2023. And, you know, you want to make sure that you have your staff together and you have your program built on a solid foundation when your first game is going to be against Deion Sanders, uh, Colorado program. So I, I think that, that it's, you know, we don't want to look at it too much, but TC fans are certainly going to be aware that prime's first power five game is against the Horde Frogs. That's, that's, that's going to be an interesting one down in the future. Um, you know, I, <laughs> You, you were there for the Big 12 championship. Um, you know, like I said, you've watched a lot of TCU football this year, much to your chagrin. Um, what do you think, I don't want to say went wrong for the Horned Frog Saturday against Kansas State, but uh, they did not look as, uh, as, as fluid on offense and, and maybe defensively struggled. And that just could be, you know, Deuce Vaughn, everyone struggles against Deuce Vaughn. But is there anything that you have concerns about TCU or do you think that with the three plus weeks to prepare, they'll, they'll look more like their quote unquote old selves against Michigan, who also have to have a pretty dang good defense as well. Yeah, I mean, a couple things. So first of all, I mean, a rematch is always tough. Uh, I, I think that these two teams know each other so well. And frankly, I mean, I said this before the Big 12 title game, the, you know, CC played a lot of games where they had to come back and and be competitive in that way. Kansas State was the one game where I walked away feeling like maybe the better team didn't win that day. Yeah. And um and and I think that some of the the questions I had about that matchup came out in the Big 12 title game. Now Part of it is that Kansas State's really good, right? Yeah. Like it's hard to beat really good teams all the time. And TCU's managed to do it for 12 straight weeks. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, sometimes, sometimes you just come short and it was literally six inches short, right? Yeah. And, and, so, and 10, 10 straight weeks of playing a game yeah. too for the Horn right. Frogs, which certainly has something exactly. to do with that. Exactly right. And so I think, I think some of it is just they lost a football game, right? Like, I I think that some of it is just uh, playing a really competitive team twice. Um, you know, I think that the one piece that I would be looking at a lot if I'm TCU's coaching staff is they have to find the way to find a way to make the game easier in the passing game for Max Duggan against this Michigan defense, because you saw moments. I, I texted uh, the, the group chat about this a little bit. There were moments there in the third quarter where I said, this looks like the old TCU offense where you're just throwing bombs and hoping that Quentin Johnston bails you out. And in the fourth, you started to see that come back around, right? You, you almost in these, uh, not that it was a two minute drill, but in these two minute drill type situations, then it's like, okay, they settle down, they do things and, and make things easy for Max Duggan. I, I think they're going to have to come out that early against Michigan, right? I, I don't think that you can I think you almost have to expect that that Quentin Johnson's going to be covered up and that it has to be Savion Williams and Darius Davis and Jordan Hudson, who I thought, you know, was really close to having an incredible game uh, in the Big 12 title game. But, you know, that I think it's these other receivers that have to step up. I'd love to see them use Jared Wiley a little bit more. You see these moments where, where uh, you know, he has game changing plays and you wonder why he's not a little bit more involved sometimes. So uh, I, I think that for sure, you know, that's going to be a big part of it. And and defensively, uh, Michigan probably plays to TCU's strengths in terms of stopping the run a little bit better than Kansas State, right? You're not getting out into the open field quite the same way. And I'd imagine Johnny Hodges is probably back for this game. And I think he's probably the, uh, the, the type of linebacker you want against this Michigan type of offense. But, you know, look, I, I think you look at that Ohio State game. It has to be avoiding coverage busts. And I trust TCU secondary more than I trust Ohio State, especially at corner. Um, you know, there's a Thorpe Award finalist in that in, in that backfield. And, uh, you know, so I, I think they're going to be a little bit be uh, more able to kind of keep up. But uh, they have to stay really, really uh fundamentally sound against this Michigan team because they're going to get moved. I mean, just, just frankly, Michigan's offensive line is going to win the battle against TCU's defensive line, but it's, can they, can TCU still win that battle at the linebacker level? And I like what I've seen from D winters and Johnny Hodges and Chad Banks and all these guys who have contributed, but I think those are the two things they have to find uh, easier plays in the passing game uh, with some of those uh, second and third and fourth string receivers. And they have to be able to, to be uh, fundamentally sound on the back end because you're kind of seeding that, that front end matchup, most likely, how can you make up for it in other places? It's so, you know, I think it's so interesting because you talk about, you know, it, it feels a lot like TC going into the Wisconsin game, you know, where they're a little undersized on both sides. You have a very powerful run game, a very, very good offensive line. And like you said, Michigan's going to win the battle in the trenches more often than not on both sides of the ball, just based on on where the strength of that team is and the physical strength of that team. Um, a healthy TC probably has a better shot of competing 
um, than kind of, you know, the bandage together pipe cleaners and, and, and wishes, you know, that's, that's been going on here for the last couple of weeks. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right. If you can, if you can get them into third and long and then avoid those big coverage busts, there's a chance. I mean, there's always a chance, especially with this TCU team. Um, you also mentioned, you know, Jared Wiley, and I've been, you know, harping on that all season too. But I, I think, again, that comes down to the protection when you have to keep Wiley and Spivey in to help or you have to get them to chip and do things because the offensive line is is losing those battles up front then you're taking one of the most dynamic weapons that tcu has on offense away especially when you're looking at quentin johnson's going to see double teams or whatever else to let him i, I think jim harbaugh will make sure that qj is not the guy that beats him uh, in glendale for sure um you know you, you talked a little bit about this matchup and where the strengths and weaknesses are um it, it, the thing I think TCU fans will always feel like they have a shot as long as Max Duggan is on the field and you know for the Horn Frogs having a, a this is the first Heisman finalist TCU has had in, in two decades more than two decades now since LaDainian Tomlinson was in New York uh, Max oddly probably has a better shot of winning the award than LaDainian Tomlinson had um, when you look at it Max Duggan is a Heisman candidate uh, someone who's covered, you know, Heisman winners who, you know, obviously is very familiar with with Baylor's Heisman winner. Do you do you see him as having a shot? Do you see him as a, a viable contender for this award? And what about him makes him a good fit in New York? Yeah, well, I think that uh, I, I don't, I'd say, expect him to win the award. I think that Caleb Williams probably wins the award, but... I view him absolutely as a real contender. I think that when you look at the the Big 12 title game, I mean, I'll tell you what, there there was nobody happier uh, in Arlington than Brett Yormark on Saturday because th- that game was not just the best game of the weekend, which I think is pretty obvious, but was also, I think, such a showcase for some of these players in this game, right? People are going to remember Deuce Vaughn after this game and people nationally really recognized who Max Duggan was. And, uh, you know, the, the funny thing is, I think that sometimes people people get very bogged down in the idea of this being a best player award and it's not right i i'm, I'm gonna say flat out max duggan is not just not one of the four best players in america he's not the best player on his team quentin johnson's better but that's not what the award is right and and i think that people need to understand that and when you look at the story of the season because this is a narrative award people view that as a negative but it is a narrative award uh how can you point to many narratives in college football that are better than what tcu did this year and they have these great other players, Kendra Miller, Quentin Johnson. They have some key guys uh, on defense, of course. Uh, Travis Hodges Tomlinson is a Thorpe Award finalist. Uh, but when you look at what's been consistent across this season, it's not Quentin Johnston. He's missed a lot of games. He's been hampered in a lot of games. Max Duggan is the constant. And I think that you have to look at not just how he played in the Big Bowl Championship game, where he literally carried TCU back into that game. I mean, it is... I, I don't know if there was a more impressive single drive by a player than yeah. the game tying drive, right? Like that is, that is a, an all time great college football drive. And, and if, if he again, falls a yard further forward in overtime, then we might be talking about this as one of the great drives ever, right? Like that's, yeah. that's the kind of conversation we could be having. Um, but it, it's still enough that I think it really caught people's attention. And, I think that he led, what, four game-winning drives over the course yeah. of the season. I mean, it is just, it's one of those things where we can talk about the process and we can talk about the skill. And like, again, Max isn't going to be picked in the first round of the NFL draft like some of these other quarterbacks on this list, but he did things, the results on the field and what he did in these moments stands above. And so, again, I think this is Caleb's award to lose, but if I had a ballot, I don't have a ballot, but if I had a ballot, I would have gone Caleb one, Max two, and then probably Hendon Hooker three. So I think he's very much a legitimate uh, Heisman finalist. I think he'll probably finish number two, which is just, you know, amazing, right? Yeah. It's just a, an unbelievable opportunity. And, and uh, if you had told me one year ago that I was going to be making the Max Duggan Heisman case, then I would have assumed that he switched to running back and transferred to Alabama or something. I could not have imagined anything close to this. And, uh, and so regardless, I mean, it's cool, of course, to win the thing, uh, you know, and that's, that's program changing, but whenever they show the video of the uh, award winner being decided, Max Duggan's going to be in that video, no matter what happens and uh, forever. Right. So I, I think that is a huge moment regardless. 
I think the only person that a year ago would have believed Max Duggan could win the Heisman is our mutual fan, friend, uh, Grant McGalliard. I think he's the only one. Uh, and I think that's only because he named his dog Max Duggan. Which, so, which by know. the way, that was a topic of conversation last year whenever Chandler came in and played better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Should, should, should he consider uh, changing, changing his dog's name? name? But he, he kept uh, he kept solid and ultimately, <laughs> you know, so he's funny. got uh, he's got the, the, the best dog in, uh, in all of Texas. It's true. You know, you, you talk about kind of just the story of Max Duggan and and I was watching Sunday Night Football. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to compare Max Duggan and Tom Brady. But when you see a team that struggles for three and a half quarters like the Tampa Bay Bucks did against Andy Dalton, oddly enough, um, you know, on Sunday night, and you watch the times that TCU has has struggled for a half or for three quarters, only to see Max Duggan pull something out, a rabbit out of his hat or 95 yards out of his legs on a final drive to to do these improbable wins. Um I don't think that anybody operates that two minute drill better than Max Duggan and the symbi symbiosis that he has with Garrett Riley in that moment, because, you know, Garrett Riley's first drives the last two games have been two of the best scripted drives I've seen this season from any program. But then there's been this big lag in the middle only to have Max Duggan pull something kind of crazy out of a hat to, to keep his team alive and in it. And, and you're right. It's a narrative award and, and yeah, there's not a better story in college football this year than TCU. And there's probably not a better individual story than Max Duggins over the course of his four years. Um, before I let you go, and I want to, I want to honor your time. I know you got a busy day ahead. Um, you did say you, you do believe TCU can pull off this upset. It looks like the line is going to be probably somewhere between six and a half and eight and a half by the time we get to game time. What about this matchup, um, in addition to what you've already said, makes you think TCU has a chance, or is the simple answer just Max Duggan? Well, first of all, it, it is inevitable that uh, my alma mater's biggest rival is going to embarrass me, of course, because that's just how this works. But I, <laughs> no, I, I really do like this matchup for TCU, right? Because Michigan is a team built to win the Big Ten. And I don't think that necessarily means that it's built to go out into the world. That's something that, mm -hmm. that uh, talking to Ohio State people, that team is built to win in the college football playoff. It's not yeah. built to win in the Big Ten. So a couple things I like. One, I think that when you look at the Purdue game, the Big Ten title game, I'd advise TCU fans to go back and watch that game. Uh, and also the Ohio State game. The, the difference in those games was not necessarily – Michigan doing things that the other team couldn't compete with it was situational football it was mm -hmm. for Purdue it was when they were in the red zone they settled for field goals five times right like you can't do that against Michigan or you're going to get blown out which they did uh you know and and TCU has one of the higher touchdown rates in the red zone in the country uh they're they're actually actually their, their red zone conversion rate is middle of the pack but that's because they don't settle for field goals right yeah. they're they're willing to try and score a touchdown instead. So they actually score touchdowns on 82% of their red zone possessions, which is huge, right? And so I, I think that, um, that that's going to be a key in this game. And in the Ohio State game, I think that we saw that CJ Stroud's inability to move the chains in those short yard situations on a third and three, something like that, uh, was huge. Knowing that you have Max Duggan there in those moments, I think forces Michigan to defend all 11 players uh, mm -hmm. in just a different way. So... Uh, and then on top of that, when you look at that Purdue game, obviously they were able to move between the 20s uh, and, and kind of struggled in the red zone. But the, the other way they did it was with their star receiver, Charlie Jones. And um, and Charlie Jones had 160 yards, I think 13 catches in that game. Um, so I, I do think that if you can win that if you if you can compete up front against Michigan and just give Max Duggan some time, I do think that there's places where you can win in the secondary uh and, and the other part of that too is i just think that um that tcu is kind of in some ways a very souped up version of what purdue yeah. does right they've got they've got a better quarterback they've got a better receiver they've got a better running back they've got a better defense in my opinion and so um i, I think that's going to be a big part of it i think that it's just going to be trying to get that game off schedule uh you know you mentioned those scripted drives from garrett riley they need to score a touchdown on the first drive Right. They yeah. need to get Michigan off schedule and force them to press even the tiniest bit. And uh, and I think that's the pathway to winning this game. Now, look, Michigan's also very good, you know, and so if if uh, there is a world where where TCU can't compete up front and it's just kind of a slog. Right. That, that absolutely is a world that exists. I don't think it's going to happen. I, I will say 
I like the matchup against this year's Michigan team better than I would have liked it against last yeah. year's team. Because Hutchinson. <laughs> right, right. Because that's the biggest thing, right? They've got guys up front. They're more built to stop the run than the pass and to get after the quarterback. Uh, I would have not enjoyed the matchup if it's those two, uh, you know, Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo versus TCU's tackles. I think, yeah. I think that you look at TCU, they're really strong on the interior line and they're not all that strong at tackle, right? Like that was the question coming into the year and they kind of didn't answer it, but didn't have to in some ways. Um, so I think the fact that, t- that Michigan is more of an interior pass rushing team with guys like Mozzie Smith than, than the Aiden Hutchinson who have been there the years before, that's a better matchup to me than uh, than being challenged on the outside. If, if they were challenged on the outside, I'd have some real questions sure. about them. But, yeah. but I, th- I think that, uh, that this is a pretty good matchup, all things considered, and it's probably going to be a relatively low scoring game. So it's going to be about trying to win in those situations, right? Playing good situational football, uh, converting when you have to, not letting Michigan just run the game clock out. Uh, and, and I think that certainly, you know, look, they have to be, it's fundamentally sound on the front end and back end uh, against Michigan's offense. But I think they've played pretty well from that perspective all year long, especially in the second half. And, and look, I mean, TCU hasn't been an awesome, awesome run defense uh, defense all year, but when they scheme to stop the run against Texas, they stop yeah. the run. So I, I think that it's possible. Donovan Edwards is going to have a breakaway touchdown. You're going to have to sustain that but uh but i think that if you can kind of stay on track stay on schedule get michigan slightly off schedule force them to press and force them to put the ball in jj mccarthy's hands i I think tcu absolutely has a shot well we appreciate you being a believer and i hope that you don't get canceled by baylor for picking tcu to win this game um i I think that this is one of the rare years where most of the big 12 will be rooting for each other across bowl season uh, you may even see some of us hoping that Texas wins the game. So it's 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 going to be a weird a weird year, I think, for uh, for the rest of the fandom. Uh, before I let you go, where can people find your work, Sean? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, you know, you guys can go in and support uh, my Baylor Bears over in Fort Worth. They're going to be playing at Air yeah, Force. Yeah, which is so great. It's such a delight. They're playing it's against so Air Force in Amon G. Carter Stadium. Like, the just disrespect so- of the troops is going to happen on that game. I just, I tell you. It's, it's man, uh, this has been, this has been quite a year for the Big 12. It's been a lot of fun. But, uh, but yeah, you can find all my work at cbsports.com. Follow me on Twitter at Shahan J. Raja. Uh, also check out my podcast, the College Football Survivor Show, where, by the way, uh, TC is pretty relevant in that discussion yeah. these days. Yeah. And uh, and so we, we talk about the playoff basically from a big picture lens all year round. And, and obviously it's going to be pretty exciting uh, when we get to a 12 team playoff, how, how the show kind of changes. So make yeah. sure to check that out as well. All right. You're the absolute best. Thanks for so much for uh, for jumping on with us. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, for one time and one time only because they're playing in Amy, Amy G. Carter Stadium, Sikkim Bears.